right, cool. I think uh, let's let's jump into it, and then um, I'm sure people will keep jumping in. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chantal Wireco, and I will be your host and MC today. At Density, I'm a product manager where I work on our core customer experience. But in a previous life, I used 3D scanning and uh, sensors to solve construction problems, to document existing conditions, and to design space as a product at different startups, including WeWork. So I am a self-identified spatial data nerd. And today I'm excited to chat with Jamie Roche, CEO and founder of Helix RE and uh, newest member to the Density family about smart buildings for better spaces. Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, Jamie Roach. I've been uh, circling around architecture and buildings and technology now for a while. My deep background is I went to Yale. I have uh, an architecture degree. I think I was one of the first people uh, in the architecture program to use CAD which I know it's hard to believe now, but there was one single uh, Katia station stuck in a, in a closet. And uh, I was studying the reintroduction of ornament into architecture. And I used a Katia system, which I thought was ironic. It was designed for uh, jet, to design jet fighters, French jet fighters. And I was using it to explore uh, geometric uh, pattern languages for stained glass. So that was my deep background. Um, I ended up doing a variety of things, some architecture, some building, and then uh, found my way to Silicon Graphics. And this was back when Silicon Graphics was really the, the Google of its time. Uh, they were making it easy for people to present three-dimensional reality on a screen. I uh, used, uh, I think in the most famous way early on Jurassic Park. But while I was there, I had an experience that was really fundamental to me. Uh, Jim Clark, who was then the CEO, came in and presented the internet. And it was still pre-commercial. But uh, I was in sales and I had a problem then. We all had the same problem really, which was we would get asked to be experts on a very wide variety of things real time by potential customers. So I get a call from Goldman Sachs saying, uh, we're trying to uh, build a system that will predict the value of a portfolio of assets five years in the future. We wanna do that graphically. And then somebody call and say, we're trying to interpret satellite photos from space real time. What is the system configuration that allow us to have the greatest throughput of these very large files? Uh, and on and on and on. And what we would do is we would, we would try and answer the question as best we could, but you know we didn't have this range of knowledge. None of us did. Uh, so we had three ring binders. Uh, we had local experts. Uh, we could place a call and, and try and do this all real time. So after we saw Jim uh, uh, present the internet, then it was an intranet. We started collecting all of this information and created a, a, an internet sister, intranet system that allowed us to do it all on the computer. So quickly pull up images, quickly pull up text, figure out who was the person I was supposed to call. And it was this, this sort of uh, fundamental phase change in the way information was accessed that really lit things up for me. Uh, so I, I left SGI shortly thereafter and I, I started a company that built e-commerce systems. And we built uh, early large scale e-commerce systems for people like uh, Best Buy and, and uh, uh, Nike uh, and, and learned an awful lot there uh, that I think uh, had a bearing on what we're doing now. Um, the biggest thing that we learned was that uh, you can see the future, right? Uh, you can know that uh, if you're a large scale uh, e-commerce uh, retailer, then uh, that things are going to go a certain way and you can try and get there as quickly as you can, right? So we had one of the largest retailers in the world come to us and say, uh, uh, we would like to have Amazon plus eBay plus Facebook and we have unlimited resources. Uh, can you build this for us? And uh, as soon as they left the room, we looked at each other and said, well, that's just not going to work, right? It's too much. It's ocean boiling, right? So we need a way to begin this process that is uh, uh, achievable that is, uh, uh, will deal with the inevitable change management processes and changes to the business itself, both internal, you know, how are our people gonna do their jobs with this, but also external, how do our customers think about us and how they can interact with us. Uh, and I think this maps pretty clearly to uh, smart buildings and, and to what I, you know, I like to think of as the internet of buildings. So that's my background. I, I left there, I ended up through a series of moves uh, with a company called Flux. Flux spun out of, of Google. The initial idea for Flux was to do automatic building generation, uh, generative building design, uh, they called it. Uh, we, we concluded the market wasn't ready for that, but what the market was ready for was kind of a duplication of what 
Google did for all other knowledge, but for building knowledge. And the way that they said it and that we say it is very simply collecting, organizing, and making useful, really making, making searchable without special skills, all the world's knowledge, or in our, our case, all sorts of information about buildings. Uh, we thought about the ocean boiling problem. And we said, instead of trying to do that all at once, the way that, that the bigger guys would, would approach it, uh, we think incorrectly, we'll start from a corner and work out, right? What's the most important thing, right? And, uh, and that, that had us think a little bit about, about what is a smart building? What is an internet of building? And, and what is the thing that they all need? And what we concluded was it needed what, we, what we'll call an information index, a geometric file cabinet, if you will, where you can store this information, right? Excuse me, whether it's uh, pathfinding information, you know, how do I get to the bathroom, whether it's uh, personnel information, uh, any kind of building information. If we have this sort of geometric index where we can attach this information, it's going to make it easier to get to the information you need, uh, more intuitive, uh, and, and on and on. So that's what we set out to build with, uh, with Helix. We spent a lot of our time and energy uh, lowering the time and cost for a group of people to enter a building with some kind of device. And then shortly thereafter, leave with a usable three-dimensional model of the building. Uh, we spent the next chunk of time on making it so that you didn't have to be trained or have any special software to interact with this. And then we started working on the third piece, which is how do we now start adding information to this? And we ended up getting close to density. We said, well, that's really great information. You know, how are people, how are people moving through the building? How is the building really acting? You know, now we can start making data-driven decisions about real estate investments, whether it's, should I buy this building? Uh, should I invest in it? How should I change it? How should I configure it, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we decided we, we liked the, the combination so well that we would make it formal. Yeah, it's super interesting. You know, like when you're talking about smart buildings, I'm sort of hearing this trifecta. Um, Helix has really been working on the skeleton of the building and digitizing that, um, all of the spatial information, the, the atoms, um, if you will. And um, the density component is starting to talk about the live inputs into kind of like the brain of the building. So when we talk about smart buildings, what, what are all the things that go into making it smart? How would you define that? You know, I think it's a little bit of a moving target, right? I mean, there's lots and lots of academic and, and uh, sort of forward thinking uh, discussions about this. You can get online and, and, and take a look. You probably already have. Uh, from our point of view, it's very convenient to structure the question and map it metaphorically to the human body, right? So uh, human body, you got, the, you got the frame and the muscles and the skeleton and, and, and all that kind of stuff. You have senses, lots and lots and lots of senses, millions of, of nerve endings. You've got eyes, ears, mouth, nose, et cetera. Um, and these senses are all providing input uh, to something right? To the brain, right? And, and the brain yeah. has a couple of levels to it. It has the first one, which is which senses should we, should we pay any attention to? Some things are, are managed autonomically, right? A piece of dust comes towards your eye and you, and you close your eye without thinking about it. And then there are things that are more cognitive, right? So uh, if there's a sensor that's firing, uh, should we do anything about it, right? And what should we do about it, right? Ideally, something happens automatically. You know, a fire extinguisher goes, uh, goes off or a, a message is sent to the to a variety of people who can respond to it. So, uh, so this is kind of the way that we're, that we're thinking about it. Uh, in, in order for this to be fully fleshed, oh, and, and by the way, I would take it one step further. And that is that we're still just talking about a smart building, right? Buildings exist in communities like people do. So buildings have next door neighbors, they're in cities, they're in states, et cetera. Uh, so there, there probably should be some communication ability between the different cities and between the, the people who might add services to the, to the set of buildings. Yeah, so it's really this idea of kind of um, measuring and learning. Uh, so it sounds like we're setting ourselves up with a solid foundation right now. We're documenting and we're making that documentation available, but we don't really know, um, you know, uh, what's next. And we're really just learning about the questions that we can now start to ask of this information. Um, to that note, I've heard you mention the grandma standard. How important is accessibility of this information? I think it's really important. I mean, it's sort of a fundamental truth of all of all software systems. But when we were building these e-commerce systems, um, uh, my wife said something to me that really stuck. And she said, uh, she said, you know, when I hear engineers talking about software, they're sort of condescending. Like, well, that's obvious. You should know this is a standard pattern. You should do this, this, and this. She says, what you got to keep in mind is that people are busy. 
they don't care as much about your software as you do, right? And they're not going to learn it. So just think about uh, when you're designing an interface for somebody that, that your customer is a mom, that she's got a job, this is the end of the day, that she's got a baby, the baby is crying and the phone is ringing, right? That's how much attention span you have. So, so uh, if things are not so easy, Google easy, right? That, uh, that grandma can get on there and she could do sophisticated uh, you know, cross data theory, uh, uh, queries, right? Uh, what's the nearest restaurant? Are they open? Uh, what's their best dish? And uh, uh, you know, that sort of, of, of question, that's the grandma standard. Uh, and, and I wouldn't have thought it was possible until we saw what started to emerge from, from internet applications. But now that we know that it is possible, it's really the only target is, can somebody use this without special software, without special training, without 100% of their attention and get good value so that they ask themselves a question, or how did I do this without this? Yeah, as somebody who had a baby six months ago, um, I have a deeper appreciation for the lack of time. So. Um, <laughs> So you Absolutely. should switch to the uh, to the usability testing group now. <laughs> yeah, I You're would perfect. love to provide some some feedback. Um, I'm going to pick on architects for a second here because you mentioned engineers can be kind of uh, condescending. Um, I think design is in a similar category, right? Like we architects can be very cerebral, and um, I I'm educated as an architect, so I understand like there are a lot of conversations that happen at this level about design. We can kind of siloed. Um, what's the role of digitizing buildings? for design, how is it helping um, kind of everybody weigh in and help inform um, and helping to break down those silos? Oh, I like that question. Um, first of all, I should, I should sort of preface it by saying I have, I have tremendous respect and, and fondness for architects. So anything that I say should be- Same, should, should, for should the record, be, me too. Should be, should be heard in that, in that light. But I think the pressure on architects is very, uh, is extreme. Right, they uh, they have to get customers. They have to get attention. They want to do something that's important, right? And so there's all this, this sort of uh, pressure on them to do certain things. The way that that's kind of worked out is that architects have, they dress a certain way to to symbolize that they're different, right? They act a certain way to symbolize that they're creative, right? And and all of that is to provide counter pressure to to customers saying, you know, just do what I tell you to do. Right, I want, I want that plus that plus that. Here's my Pinterest board, go make it happen, right? And so you have one of two things. You either have an untrained person designing a building uh, if, by proxy, you know, through the architect, or you have an architect who stands up and says, you know, I'm Frank Lloyd Wright. You're gonna, I'm gonna deliver the house that I wanna deliver and if it leaks, you know, too bad, right? Neither of these are good. What we want is we want data-driven decisions, right? We want hypotheses, we want to run tests, whether it's natural experiments with existing buildings or whether it's structured experiments. Uh, we want to be able to, uh, to have an idea about what, for example, I mean, this is very topical now, uh, what should an office be, right? Should it just be all hoteling desks and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, conference spaces? Should it be like a Soho uh, club, like a, a a comfortable place where you where you like going there better than your own home, you know, is it is it something else, right? Uh, we just don't know the answers to this. We have hypotheses, but until we until we start measuring, does this really uh, does this really work, right? We can do surveys. We can ask customers what they think they want, right? We can ask people who have been living at home for the last year and a half and can walk their dog whenever they want. What do you want out of your office? And they'll say, well, I don't know, foosball table comfortable couches and espresso machine. But, uh, you know, we did all that, right? We put in foosball tables. We had ping pong tables. We did the WeWorky kind of stuff uh, back in, in fact, before WeWork. And uh, what we found is that the ping pong tables were never used. And yep. the tap, the beer tap was very rarely used. And what it was, it was used in a way we yeah. didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, so, you know, take it all the way back to your question. With, with the density sensors, what we have now is we have the ability to test our hypotheses. Are people going where they want? Are they staying as long as we want? Uh, and I think it gives us a really strong foothold when we start combining that geometric information with the usage information uh, to start uh, trying new things, right? And seeing if things work. Seeing if things work initially, seeing if things work over time, right? And using that, I think smart architects will look at that and say, I'm a great architect because I'm a good, I'm a good creative person. I can come up with new ideas. I'm a great architect because I'm a good synthesizer, right? I traveled to Italy and I, I you know, I went to the, the best WeWorks around the world and, and, uh, and I've synthesized this information. I've mapped it to your problem. And here's what, what I, 
what you should do, but not what you should do, what I think you should do. Right. Yeah. So that's all from my point of view, that's all, uh, it's all an experiment preparation exercise. I have a hypothesis or I have several hypotheses. And now what we want to do is we want to get them out in the field and we want to see if they work. Right. And now we, yeah. we add the data to it and the data starts informing the hypotheses and we just get smarter and smarter. Right. So it doesn't, it doesn't obviate the need for architects. It just makes the architects less about posturing and sort of parading their, their difference in, in their education and more about uh, learned uh, refinements of all those things. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I love about density data is it's not so much um, dictating what to do, but it's helping people ask a question and then establish a feedback loop and really measure something, right? So um, in some ways, we're really helping designers arm them with information, right? Um, but in other ways, it's uh, accepting that we don't know that much about how people like to use space, especially given today's climate and um, coronavirus and everything that comes along with that. And um, we're really here to learn and listen and uh, act on that information. I think it's, really, I think it's brilliant. I, I really do. I, you know, a year or two ago, if you'd asked me, are, are occupancy sensors the first, uh, the first sense that this new building body should have? I, you know, I might've said maybe, maybe not, right? But, but I, I guess the, the more I, I see how it's unfolding, you know, you go into an Amazon Go store, and this sort of ability to anonymously know, you know who's, who's there and what are they doing is really, really helpful, right? And uh, you know, if you look around, you walk into buildings, you see more and more stuff on the ceiling. And I think this, that, that in many ways, the, the density sensors sort of ironically are eyes without eyes, right? They, they, they give you what would be the visual feedback without, ha without you knowing who that person is in a very accurate way. And I think that's fundamental. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Google Easy uh, in terms of um, the internet and what it allows us to do today. And I think it's crazy that, you know, I can Google an address, I can find out exactly how long it's going to take me to get there, I can walk around virtually. But what I don't know is if it's worth going, right? Yeah. There is not a lot of information about inside of buildings right now. And um, measuring experience is something that has to this point really been kind of this abstract need, but we haven't been able to do it yet. So I'm kind of curious about how like you think about the aspect, this aspect and um, where we're headed in terms of, you know, where we've kind of measured the world around buildings, but what about the spaces themselves? Uh, you know, it, it brings to mind a, a very current experience for me. I, uh, last night, my daughter, she's back from college and her friends wanted to go out in San Francisco. And, you know, we live a ways from San Francisco, about a 30 minute drive. And she asked if I would drive them in. And, and I did. And it was funny. It's one of the best things as a parent to see this as you get older. There's nothing better than being able to sit quietly in the driver's seat when they're with their friends because they forget you're there. Right. And they start actually talking. And, uh, and while we were going into the city, they were on their phones and they were looking at where, where should they go? Should we go to the marina? Should we go to Tele Telegraph Hill? And it, ultimately it came down to what it always comes down to in these social contexts. And that is where are the other people? Right, so they wanted to know it, what they what they would love to know is uh, you know, how many people are inside. Is there a queue? Right, uh, yeah. where is the thing? You know, is there something next to it? You know, how does that look? You know, the, the, the sort of the information you would love to have as a kid who's going out is this is this the right place to go? Right, and I think it, you know it's a trivial example, but I think that's really important. So, you know, what if you're Google and you're trying to optimize the productivity of your people? Right, you want to they're going to have lunch breaks and coffee breaks, but you want it to be efficient. Uh, so, you know, they should be able to, to pop up their computer and say, all right, where are the lunch options in the area? Uh, what are they serving? What's the line? Right. Yeah. So it's, so it's, again, what we're, what we're talking about is this, the, the sort of alternative, the ocean boiling. We're starting with little things that have real power and, uh, and it can be behavioral change power. It could be, uh, cost saving power, right. Uh, yep. uh investment decision-making power, but, but we build out from there. Yeah. In, in many ways we're, we're smart buildings or digital buildings are able to give kind of agency to the end user, right? Like there's this idea of voting with your feet that's been mentioned a lot, um, especially in the workplace context of today. And um, if you can't measure it, how do you know where people are voting, right? So um, I think that's, that's super important. And I guess um, if a company with a large workplace, for example, were to approach you and say, how do we know that our spaces are the right place to go. How would what would be your advice for somebody looking to get started? It can be <laughs> quite a daunting task, right? To think you know, about digitizing an entire building. 
Yeah, a month ago, I would have said digitize your building. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> think, think, about, uh, think about your building like, uh, like you think about your business, right? No, no business, uh, I don't know if there are any businesses anymore that don't have a website, right? So the very first thing is get online and then you can start figuring out what to do next and what's gonna bring value. Obviously it's better to have a, an, a, an initial uh, project and hypothesis when you start, but <clears throat> the first thing you need is the structure itself. So if, if the building is not digitized, <clears throat> then it is not accessible remotely, whether remote is upstairs from the cafe or you know, uh, 3,000 miles away, right? So the first thing that, that, that we recommend is to, uh, is to get your building digitized. Now, uh, what we have been working on on that front is uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, if you wanted to, to create a digital model of the building, you, know, you, would, you would walk into the building with a tape measure and a clipboard, or if you had a little more money, you had a, one of those little red dot laser measuring tools. And you would start uh, making notes, and then you'd go back to your, your architect, would go back to their desk, and they'd start uh, crafting a model, either a 2D model or a 3D a BIM model. And uh, it was, it's hard work, it's time consuming, it requires real skill and expertise. And uh, the result is something that, that most people can't use, right? Uh, I don't know how many, how many people on this call uh, have ever cracked open a Revit model, but uh, it's a wonderful piece of software, but it's not easy. Right. And so, and it's expensive, right? It takes a while to learn and you have to keep up with it. Otherwise it gets away from you. Uh, so uh, what's happened is uh, we now have new tools. We have LIDAR, right? This uh, uh, laser-based system that shoots lots and lots of those little red dots and then returns as kind of three-dimensional uh, measured dot matrix model of the building. And then we have, we have various forms of artificial intelligence and, and computer vision, deep learning that allow us to interpret that data and then to speed up the process of taking it from points in space into a, so they call it a semantically organized model, right? These dots are a floor and these dots are a wall. And now we have uh, increasingly good tools online that take that very, very large complex file and turn it into something that's more like a video game, right? So, uh, so I know that I can walk through it. I know I, if, if I click on that circle, I'm gonna advance forward or if I, uh, anyway, I can take measurements digitally and that kind of thing. So what's happened is the, the, the threshold of cost and skill to produce the model has come way down and the threshold to consume the model has come way down, right? So now what we have is we have this structure and we can start adding other information to it. And you know, we, we deliberately took a, a, a this sort of reverse ocean boiling approach to this thing. We said, all right, let's find one thing that people need this for. We won't sell them the thing that we know they're going to want and they're going to need. They're not going to, they're not going to know how, to, how they could live without it before. We're going to give them something they want. So uh, if Google wants to have, they bought a new building, they've gotten it from National Semiconductor or somebody else, and it looks like a, an MIT lab, and they want it to look like a googly space, right? They need to have uh, accurate 3D models. And they tend to design in 3D, right? It's not just, yeah. where do I put the cubes? It's, what do I hang from the ceiling? And how does the space feel and light and sound and all that kind of stuff? So they really need 3D. So they needed what we, what we were producing and we work with them to reduce the time to produce a three-dimensional model from uh, you know, months uh, to days, right? And everybody else gets the benefit of that. It's like, it's like uh, Tesla and, and other guys uh, figuring out uh, self-driving cars, advancing the, the state of the art in, in AI technology. Well, we all get to, get to use that now, right? It's almost free yeah. uh, to tap into that stuff. So all that's really working in our favor. So uh, you know, two years ago, if I were to go to a, a REIT or a large scale uh, a real estate owner or operator and said, hey, you know, for two bucks a foot, I can digitize your entire space. They will walk me out the door, right? Unless they were about to do a renovation. Now we go in and we say, uh, listen, we can give you a usable model of this thing that you can use to illustrate conversations and plan and do all this kind of stuff. And it's gonna cost you, you know, 30 something cents a foot. Uh, they've moved. They now are beginning to understand how uh, uh, digital twins and, and uh, smart buildings uh, are going to impact their business. The economy has changed, right? They can't just put a sign up on a building and it, and it sells anymore. Uh, they have to work a little bit harder for it. And, uh, and the cost has come way down, right? So, so that's, uh, that's been our approach is to, is to reduce the cost to get your basic, call it your website for your building, and then start looking at how do we add uh, more information to it, uh, like density, ideally information that, that updates itself automatically. You know, streaming yeah. information is the very best kind. <clears throat> and then how do we use that? And you guys have been working on the problem from the other side, which is you know, what is the value of knowing occupancy and use? Um, and we think, uh, I think we both concluded as we, as we got to know each other that, that it was the presentation 
Uh, it was the, the consumption of that data in context mm -hmm. that really unlocked the next thing. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, every time that we talk to a customer about density data, the first question we always ask is, what are, problem are you looking to solve? And so this kind of this ROI discussion for why teams want to or should invest always comes back to, well, what are the business problems that you're trying to solve? Because at the end of the day, we're not moving the needle for you, um, then there's no value. So I'm curious, um, you guys have done, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of scans, maybe, I don't know. Um, what are some of the use cases that you're coming across for people who are kind of first movers and um, ahead of the game digitizing their spaces? It's a complicated question, right? Because use case, uh, it serves a number of functions, right? One is how do I get funding to do this? What's yep. the use case I make to the CFO? And then there's the, how is it being used, right? Uh, yep. Let's start with the second one and then go to the first one. Uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is today for Helix alone now, this is not Helix plus density, but uh, for Helix alone, the, the most common highly valued use is to illustrate conversations. Right. And this started in COVID when you just you, initially you couldn't go to the building. You weren't allowed to go to the building. Right. And so we had to plan or they had to plan. Uh, and they realized that people aren't all in the same place. It's not convenient for them to come to the building. So imagine a scenario where you are uh, responsible for uh, updating a building. And uh, you're the guy, you're, you're the uh, project manager, CDRE person, let's say. Right. And you're communicating with your customer uh, at, at Google and with the, the finance people there. And then you're, you're communicating with this endless sea of uh, contractors and potential contractors, bidders. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you got to do is you got to decide what's going to happen. And so everybody gets together and they say, OK, we think we want to put in a new elevator. Right. And so you got to figure out, can we put in a new elevator? Right. Is there is there space? Uh, is there some structural element in the way? You know, can we can we get all the way to the ceiling to put the, the lift equipment or do we have to put it into the basement? These are major decisions, right? And if you do it right and you do it quickly, you're saving money. If you make a decision and you're missing some critical piece of information, you're losing money, right? Yep. You either have to redo it or you have to come back. And, and there's this sort of unfortunate uh, cascade effect, the downstream effect of, of uh, mistakes, Right? If somebody does something, doesn't have the right piece of equipment on the first day, it may cost that guy a day. You can come back tomorrow and drive back out to the thing. But it, but it, it may turn into to weeks or even months of delay as all of the downstream functions can't do their work. So, so to get back to your initial question, that the first best use of this thing is just simply for people to have illustrated conversations when they're not all at the same place. Now, when it was, when it was uh, uh, deep in the, in the uh, first wave of, of uh, COVID and people couldn't go to buildings. That's when they, that's when they had to do it. Now mm -hmm. we're finding, and we're hearing back now anecdotal from people, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up on my desk, even if I'm in the building, yeah. right? Because I'm in a workflow, I'm, I'm getting work done. And the last thing I wanna do is, is get up and go up to the fourth floor and you know, uh, take some photos and send it to people so that they can get to it eventually on their email. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna pull it up on my screen right now. I wanna go to that place. I want to find that that photo or that piece of the model or that set of points from the point cloud. I want to I want to get the other people on the line at the exact same time, even if they're in India or Italy or somewhere else. And I know I want to work through this problem right now. And so uh, real time to real information, real accurate information is the is the primary use case right now. Um, so the ROI that comes from that is uh, speed, avoidance of errors. Uh, if you're doing a construction project, a remodeling project, there can be significant fines if things are late. Uh, so mm -hmm. you can recover the cost of this, of this effort in, in you know, one or two mistakes. Uh, you can recover the cost of this effort in you know, a couple dozen trips to the, to the building that don't have to happen. Actually, yeah. there's, there's one, one sort of curious one that comes out of it, which is uh, because uh, subcontractors and bidders don't necessarily have to physically go to the space to get highly detailed and accurate information, uh, they produce more accurate bids, right? So, so since they know they're in a competitive situation, it lowers the cost of the bid. They don't have to put in as much buffer because they know more information. So there's less likely that there's going to be a, a mistake and it's easier to respond, right? Yeah. If I'm an hour away, I may want to do the project, but I may not want to go back and forth to, to get the information required to bid on the project if, I, if I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to, uh, to win it. Right, so I'm expanding. I'm potentially expanding my my uh, uh, universe of bidders. Uh, lower price, more accurate, fewer mistakes, etc. Um, 
As far as the bigger, longer term ROI, I think we're dealing with really major themes now, and it's not entirely clear how it's going to work out. But but I, I think that, the, well, I don't think, I know, I know that the whole real estate world has fundamentally shifted. I know that the way that, that uh, uh, space planning and space execution is fundamentally shifted, and it, and it is not uh, anywhere near complete yet, right? So we, what, we, what we have is we have an environment where for the next X number of years, uh, things are going to be in motion until they sell, right? If I owned a whole bunch of office buildings uh, or office space, uh, I, I would be very worried. You know, how do I differentiate my space? How do I present it better? Not just what it is to more people digitally, but also what it might become, right? So that people can get excited yeah. about it. Uh, so, so there's a, an ROI around uh, occupancy percentage. Can I get the thing leased? Can I get it leased for more? Uh, there is ROI around uh, operational efficiency, right? If I'm responsible for keeping a building running, then I'm constantly bringing people in. I'm having them change out the carpet or paint or do this or do that. Uh, and if I can do that faster, more efficiently, get more bids, get tighter bids, and I'm going to save money there. Um, and then I think there are the, the, the really interesting ones, like you, you brought up with architecture, and I'd say there's a parallel one with, uh, with space planning for, for companies. I want to know what is good space, yeah. right? And, and, and so you know, what we're learning with AI is that the first thing is you have, to, you have to pick your success metric. So what is good space, right? Is if, I'm, if I'm a real estate owner, it's, it's space that gets leased for the most amount and, and gets operated for the least, right? And then sells for the most in, in the end. If I'm, uh, if I'm Google, I want to know what space uh, helps me attract people, the right kind of people. What space makes them not leave? You know, when Facebook calls them and offers them, you know, 50% more. Uh, I want to know what space makes people productive, right? If I know that, uh, that I'm getting, you know, four or five good hours out of people, how do I make that six hours, right? Uh, how do yeah. I get them into the right mind frame? Uh, so these questions are uh, not entirely space related, but, but somewhat, you know, how do I create environments that, uh, that attract, retain, and then improve the performance of my, of my human capital? And then, you know, we talked about the architecture one, which is how do we just, how do we improve buildings, right? And what we haven't talked about is the other pieces of it, which is, it's not just about building design, right? It's also about uh, building efficiency, Right and mm -hmm. cost efficiency we talked about already, but uh, but also uh, energy use, you know, sustainability. You know, how do we make buildings better? Right, and uh, and then there's safety, and and I think the the Helix Plus density is going to have a big role in this. Right, so uh, what if there's something happening in a building, or what if we think there might be something happening in the building? Right, there's an alert. You know, it appears that there's a fire in, on the 18th floor in the back room. Well, first of all, is there really a fire there? Right. So where yeah. is it? What's next to it? Can I check the sensors in those rooms? Right. Is it maybe just a malfunctioning uh, sensor? Do we really have to scramble the fire department, send them out there? Or can we check? Right. If we conclude that it is, uh, what's the extent of it? Right. Is there a, can I get a quick path to that place? You know, where should I park? Right. And yeah. all, all this stuff is, is geometry plus uh, usage data, real time on a screen, on a phone, on the fly, in a car, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what we're working towards. Yeah, so you mentioned um, some of the kind of ROI discussions centered around um, obviously projects that are on your docket. There's a clear path to ROI right away, right? This idea of efficiency and, and money savings and time, especially time. Um, and then the secondary thing, which is, you know, an amazing side effect of having all this document is it's a communication tool, right? So uh, that data may have been immediately useful for a certain project, but once you have it documented, it has a snowball effect within your organization potentially. And it's something that we hear a lot from our density customers is, you know, um, there might be one clear buyer uh, at the start, but then they start to socialize this data. Um, I'm curious in terms of the types of industries that you're seeing really uh, gravitate towards this. You mentioned um, REITs, you mentioned uh, technology workplaces. What are you, who's, who's um, digitizing and, and why do you see them kind of moving in that direction? Uh, you know, the first movers seem to be the wealthiest, you know, the, the, the Vanguard, the guys you expect, right? The NVIDIAs, the Apples, the Intels, the, the Facebooks, the Googles. Uh, they think more about where things are going and they have the resources to do something about it, which is wonderful for everybody else, right? Let them pay the bill. Let Tesla pay the bill and then everybody else can use the tech that gets developed from there. Uh, and as I said, I think there are a couple of things that, that uh, started. One was uh, we're going to have to change our buildings. We need better information to do that better. 
Uh, the next thing that's starting to happen is uh, sort of an asset uh, monitoring uh, program. So they wanna know uh, what do I own and where is it? All right, so it's now starting mm -hmm. to populate this, this, uh, this 3D filing cabinet with, with uh, content, All right? So it's now merging that uh, geometric data set with their uh, asset uh, information databases or their human information databases. Uh, and I think that's starting to come. Uh, we had a really interesting one of those where somebody said, we, we buy equipment all over the world that's very, very expensive. And uh, once it gets received, we lose track of it, right? We don't know where it is. We don't know if it's being used, uh, but we're constantly getting requests for more of it. And this is from the CFO and COO's office. I said, uh, can, we, can we, since we've photographed and laser scanned everything, can we hit that database and find them automatically, right? Uh, so we say, all right, this is what that machine looks like. Find every other one that I have, wherever they are in my, in my labs. Uh, and then can we take it one step further? Can we start instrumenting it with, with uh, IoT devices so that we can see how frequently it's being used, right? And so, you yeah. know, it's kind of like uh, it's sort of flex space and, and uh, Airbnb and cars and all that. It's, uh, we know we have about 10 times more capacity than we, uh, uh, than we need. We just don't know where it is and we can't get the capacity to the people. So, so this, uh, this idea of doing that, uh, starting to populate it with asset information is, is uh, sort of the next one. Um, we got a lot of interest uh, from cities uh, when Notre Dame burned down. They wanted they, they have these assets that they think are treasures and they wanna make sure that these things are accurately modeled just in case something happens. Uh, we, uh, I was actually in London when the Grenfell fires, I think, I don't know if you remember this, but the tower fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they were uh, having conversations about, okay, well, what happened? Uh, why did it happen? Where else is that situation, right? And I remember a conversation very explicitly where the guy said, uh, they want us to figure out every building in London that has this problem. And he looks at me like, I don't even know what this problem is. I don't know if it's the, the skin, how it was attached, solar facing, who installed it, all this kind of stuff. For me to answer that question, I'm going to have to deploy a fleet of trucks with smart people. It's going to take me months. Maybe it's not even possible. He said, I really should be able to do that with a, with a Google search. Right? Show me every other place that I have this. So, yeah. uh, so public safety in buildings and, and historical preservation is is another big one. Uh, and then the, the you know the last one is unfortunately we have this sort of steady stream of of uh, security issues that show up, first person shooter things, all that. And so uh, people want better tools to better understand and plan uh, for what should happen. Right? You know, can we understand what is the best response? Can we? Uh, can we help the people who use our buildings understand what should they do in the case of this? Uh, so I, I think these are the these are the vanguard group. Uh, but to me, this is this is very similar to the early days of the internet when the van, I don't know if you knew this, but the vanguard group was scientists, right? They wanted to share papers and they wanted to share uh, X-rays and MRIs and all this kind of stuff. And and you know the, the only way they could do it is put it onto a tape and pop it in the mail. And a few days later, you know the guys would get it or they wouldn't, right? Yeah. And, and suddenly with the internet, they could, they could be looking at the same uh, x-ray at the same time. It was very esoteric, didn't apply to everybody. But, you know, now, now you know what's happened. As you said, yeah. uh, once the thing's out there and people realize, oh, wow, this is interesting. I can really interact with my building and its information anytime I want, anywhere I want for any reason. And like, well, now I use it for this. I use it to figure out if there's a line at the coffee shop, you know? Yep. Yeah, I love that. It, it also goes back to the idea of accessibility again, right? Like, you'd hate to scan the entire Notre Dame and then put it on a floppy disk. And then years later, you're like, well, we did it, but how do we consume it? How do we open this? Like if Revit's not around anymore, what do we do if that company, you yeah. know, if it goes away? Um, so that, I think that's super interesting as well. Like this, the idea of like, how do we exchange that information once it's documented? Um, you know, Chantal, you, you brought something up twice that I think maybe, maybe warrants a couple of minutes. Um, there is this information of, uh, this is, is uh, concept of information value, right? And I've been very, I've, I've talked about a compressed time frame, right? I want to know what's going on right now, but, but there is a second one, which is uh, what if I, what if I want to answer a question I don't even know I'm going to ask yet? Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm collecting all of this information. I'm storing all of this information and, and I don't have a use for it, but it's not very expensive anymore. Right. So I just keep it. Right. And then later on down the line, somebody says, Hey, you know, could we, and the answer increasingly is, yeah, you know, we'll just go ahead and hit the database. We'll train up an AI to look for this particular pattern in that data and we'll see, you know, see what happened, whether it's 
how is the how was the space used during holiday or is it uh you know what happened last time there's a fire alarm or, or whatever uh so there is a uh, sort of an ongoing value uh, i used to actually say the opposite i used to tell people that data was cost and unless you had a real use for it don't bother storing it because it was expensive and and hard to get to and, and all that kind of stuff it's not true anymore right? you can just leave it up in a in a, a google drive or amazon or somewhere else and and uh you know pay a few bucks a month uh, for them to hold on to it for you, back it up, and then uh, if and when you need it, go get it. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, um, like a, a valuable point to highlight about kind of like the last question um, that I have, which is about the future, right? It's really easy to say we should digitize everything because it's going to help us do X, Y, and Z. But I think the point that you're bringing up is um, we don't know everything there is to know about the future. We don't know anything about the future. So um, how can we set ourselves up for success to be able to um, deal with what comes, right? Like, I think COVID highlighted a lot of that for organizations, this idea of future-proofing your, your company, your, your city, your, um, your, you know, all the places that we live and work in, um, because we don't know what's coming, and um, all we can do is kind of prepare ourselves as best as we can. Yeah, well, I, I agree. You know, I, I um, if you were to ask what data should we be storing and should we store everything? Uh, I guess my answer would be uh, store data that doesn't uh, expire, store data anonymously, right? Because you never know when some bad actor is gonna wanna hit it, right? So uh, I think that that's one of the things that really attracted us to you guys is that you have real information, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't connect to a person. Um, and store data that doesn't, uh, that's not uh, exorbitantly expensive. Right. I, I don't I don't want to say, hey, listen, just just store everything, be a pack rat, digital pack rat. Yeah. You know, don't be thoughtful Order. about it. But <laughs> but if there's some some reasonable possibility that some data is going to have a long lifespan and that you might have some use and it doesn't cost too much and it's and it's anonymous, then uh, store it. Yeah. Data stewardship. Um listen, it was really great to chat. I want to um, pause here and open it up to the audience. If anybody has any questions, please throw it in the Q and A. Um, it doesn't look like we have any yet, but um, you know, use this minute if you, if you do have something that you'd like us to touch on um, before we wrap up. I also wanted to say that uh, if you wanna get in touch with us, Jamie, um, we can share our LinkedIn, right? What's the best place to reach you at? Is that LinkedIn? Is that um, something else? Yeah, LinkedIn's good. Great, so uh, I'm about to put links to our profiles into the chat as well. If anybody would like to reach out to us, um, you know, connect, share any thoughts that you have about what we talked about today. Um, and- Hey Chantal, yeah. do you, are you, uh, is, is where you work before this a secret? It's not. Okay, good. Cause I wanna, I wanna share one more story with you cause I really like it. Um, Please do. We were uh, we had a, a very robust office in London before COVID, and uh, we were scanning a lot of buildings there, and a lot of them were for WeWork, which is where you were. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we got to be very friendly with the guys, excellent group of people, and and very forward thinking, as you would imagine, um, or as you know. Um, but a guy came to me one day and he says, "All right, here, let me tell you about a scenario." He says, "We have all these buildings, right? Enormous number. Of, I think they were the biggest landlord in London at the time. Maybe they still are." Yeah. And he said, "We have this problem that happens all the time." which is somebody will walk into a space and they'll say, uh, show me what you got. They'll be wandering around the space and they will inevitably go to a space that is not available. And they'll yep. say, I, I want one like that, right? And, and the yep. person who is receiving that call or that, that question is a, is a real estate broker, you know, smart, young, in the case of WeWork, always fun to be around people, but uh, you know, not a computer. And, uh, and so the guy says, I don't even know how you answer that question. And what does like that mean, right? Yeah. Is it is it that number of seats? Is it decorated like that? Is it windows on two walls? Is it 12 foot ceilings? Is it, you know, I don't know. What, what does that even mean, right? And uh, do you want it in this building? Do you want it anywhere in London? Do you want it in this section of London? And he said, you know, what would be cool is if we could start to organize that question. What does like that mean? You know, what is, what is true about this space? Uh, mm -hmm. What is its orientation, square footage, number of seats, uh, light quality, right? All that stuff could be stored and could be matched. And so uh, if the thing is digitized, if it is uh, data annotated, 
if it's organized, if it's searchable by grandma, then you, uh, you should be able to say, all right, uh, show me every other space that's like uh, 201. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it'll say, all right, here's what we got in the building. Here's what's available. Here's what's going to be available in the next six months. You know, here's what's available next down the street. Here's what's available, you know, uh, uh, 20 miles away. And I think this is sort of, a, you know, again, we work was really pushing the edge always. But what ends up happening is everybody else ends up falling. You know, they realize, oh, not everything they did was great, but but these things were really were really important. And I think that's the sort of unanticipated, complex, uh, you know, cross data set question uh, that we're going to find that we're, that we're asking without even thinking about it, like we do every single day on Google Maps. Yeah, I think that's where it starts to become really fun, right? Because um, it's this idea of like data and context again. We can digitize everything, but unless we've got somebody looking at it, digesting it, and like labeling it, you know. Um, supplying kind of like the metadata if you will um there's not much else we can do other than kind of this is how it is um and when you start to be able to um dissect and analyze space in terms of different qualities like you know maybe we've got something just like that but it's in seattle or we've got something just like that but it's um you know in another country so uh, i think that's where like from a design perspective also, it just starts to be really fun because it's, it's starting to be very like plastic and flexible the way that you're working with this data. Yep. So we got we some got, questions. We do. Um, first question is about security. Uh, what is the protocol and security on the programming? I run facilities for an electric co-op, uh, previously for a GC, and we have strict safety standards for getting into the system. So uh, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, yeah, this this come up a lot. Um, again, in London, we had we had some conversations with the nuclear <clears throat> authority there, and as you imagine, that was top of mind. Um, I think the way to think about this is to uh, again just map it to uh, current corporate internet use. Uh, you know, I I have all of our financial information, investor information, employee information, customer information. I can get it all through the internet. Right, I can get it through the internet, but nobody else in my organization or one or two people can get it. Certainly nobody outside the organization can get it. Uh, and that's the way we structure the information about buildings. There are some certain scenarios where it really has to be air gapped and, and on-prem uh, like nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I might make an argument that, that, that these data centers are probably more secure now uh, than, than a, uh, an air gap on-prem system uh, because of the human factor, but uh, we just treat it like that that there are layers of information uh, and their access privileges uh, that allow you to get to some, but not all the information. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the points you've made before as well is uh, just because we can digitize it doesn't mean we have to make it available to everyone. So there's this idea of um, choosing what you're sharing out to your employees or other teams within your company and um, you know, critical data gets put behind lock and key, so to speak, um, and secured to the highest standards, um, as with every other technology out there that's critical. Yep. Uh, second question, this um, is about what happens if Revit goes away. So um, we've got somebody asking about, is there a way to store 3D model or digital twin information data that's not tied to proprietary software? Is there a universal format? Yep, I can tell by the question, this is a guy I'd like to have a drink with, or a woman. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, the answer is yes, right? You can store, there, there are various, there, there are open standards for storing and sharing geometry. Uh, I think that's probably where it will go at some point. Uh, this, this hasn't been affected in the software yet just because it's not, it's not convenient and it hasn't been a development priority. Uh, right now, we have to work in the language people that, that people use and our customers use Revit and they use AutoCAD and they use PDFs, right? And they use just on-screen maps. Um, but the truth of the matter is that Revit is, a, is really a fantastic piece of software. Not everybody loves it, but, but we all use it and, and uh, I like it a lot. Um, but it, but it is, uh, it's heavy, it's complicated. Uh, it, only certain people can use it uh, both to, to build, to change, and then to access the data. Uh, and it was really built for design, right? Uh, it's, been, it's been adapted for construction, but, but really it was built for design. And, uh, and it is a proprietary uh, walled garden kind of system. So, I suspect that there will be a day, even if Revit is the center point for design and even for construction, there is some uh, abstracted version of the geometry that is a more logical index uh, for, it was effectively GIS connected data. 
you know, uh, let's print, pull in data, figure out where it goes, figure out what it attaches to. And, and uh, but, but we are not currently working on that. We know people who are. And uh, if and when uh, those tools get to be good enough, uh, it will probably be a data interface, a geometric interface to the other data. I don't know that it's going to replace Revit. I don't have a point of view on that, uh, but I do know that uh, we need the we need to meet the grain standard, and Revit does not do that. Yeah, you know what's ironic is um, you mentioned you were one of the first people to use CAD at Yale, and now it seems like architects can't get off the computer anymore. Um, you know, some, some might even say we should learn how to code. And that's really where it's headed, right? Like we're, we're talking about um, 3D point clouds, like data frameworks and um, this very elusive like technology world that many of us weren't trained in, but landed in by default because that's where the world is headed. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's getting complicated. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a question there and I'm going to make one. Yeah, please. Uh, I remember a studio I had in college and, uh, you know, there were all different kinds of architects, right? There's the engineers, yeah. uh, they're the artists and the poets. And, uh, and, uh, I, I guess I was probably more of a com combination of engineer and poet or engineer and artist. I really loved the way that buildings came together and I really loved presenting them. So I did a lot of watercolors and things like this. Uh, and I would spend hours and hours and hours preparing for a, for a crit, for a, a jury presentation at the end of the studio. And I, I built something, it was this model and it had uh, renderings that were like a Maybeck rendering and watercolor. And I was very proud to put them up there. And uh, this woman who sat next to me is a wonderful woman, but she's a poet, right? And, uh, and she had a board and she had stacked some cotton balls and, you know, a piece of cake or something, right? <laughs> and and they, they, the teachers absolutely loved it and it drove me nuts, right? Like, this is yeah. not architecture, it can't be built and all that. But what I've begun to realize is that, is that that really is architecture. It's part of architecture, right? You have to have the, the human and the creative. You have to have the engineering. You have to have the ability to communicate and present and sell your idea. I mean, it's, it's crazy that any person is expected to do all these things. Yeah. Now we're going to layer computer programming on top of it. You know, name for me somebody who you know who's a good computer programmer who's also a poet, who also can present, who also can sell, who also understands and cares a lot about static engineering and, and, and materials and cost and all this other kind of stuff. It's, it's a unicorn problem, right? So, uh, so I, I think, I'm hoping that what ends up happening is the opposite, which is architects are computer programming without knowing they're computer programming, right? That they're designing without, without they're doing engineering without knowing they're doing engineering so that they can focus on whatever is the most important thing about that particular project. You know, if it's a dam, it's one thing, if it's a, a columbarium or a, a crematorium or something, it's quite another, right? I mean, it's, uh, but expecting now that somebody who's struggled to do all these other functions is now going to become a master computer programmer to me is, is uh, you know, there'll be a niche of that. Uh, but yeah. but I, I don't think it's going to take over all of architecture. Yeah, the problem of architecture is understanding what is required, what does a customer want, what does a customer need, and what can be constructed within their budget in that context, yeah. right? Uh, that's, that's it, it's not programming, it's not engineering, it's not any of that stuff, and it's all of it. Yeah, I think what's exciting is, um, you know, architects, engineers, the um, the built environment used to just output these spaces, right, and kind of build them, and, and that's it, we're done. But what we can do now is go back and really test and validate whether we built the right thing, and if not, um, what do we need to change? I hope so. How we keep improving, I hope so. I hope that's how it gets used. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely one thing that, that I, I don't think anybody has this skill really, but architects sure don't. Uh, nobody likes to go back after the fact and do no. a postmortem. It's that right? emotional separation. <laughs> at, you know, you, you want to be able to walk away, but, um, you know, yeah. we can challenge ourselves to, to stick around yeah. and um, have a growth mindset. Then there is data now that we can use to, to keep building. Yeah, no, I think I think owners and, and civic authorities are probably going to require it, whether architects want to do it or not. Yeah, but but they are going to look and they're going to say, okay, is this thing performing? Is it meeting the lead standard? You know, two three years later, is it uh, is it safe, etc. Yeah. Uh, um, so have, having the data inputs can be critical, whether they like it or not. I'm I'm told we're not allowed to um, use language, but uh, you know, it's it's calling BS on certain decisions and learning, and and hopefully next time you come to the table, you're you're going to be more aware and. Uh, smarter right so yeah um yeah well you know i think that goes in a bunch of different directions um i think i think more about architecture 
uh, I guess more romantically. I, I, I think of architects in their relationship with their buildings like parents with their children. You know, are you really, once the kids leave and go to college, gonna sit down with your spouse and say, what did we do wrong? Right, you know, never, right? Not, uh, but, uh, but it is gonna be important and it is gonna be helpful to, uh, uh, to do this. I think what it does though also is it empowers architects for the next conversation. So what, it, what ends up happening too often in architecture is the architect has an idea that is a good idea, right? But the owner has a different idea. And so the yeah. architect says, hey, you know, we should use three inch thick slabs for the, for the countertop and the reception room. The guy's like, three inches thick, right? That's gonna cost us a mint. He yeah. says, yeah, but that extra half inch makes a difference. You know, the proportions matter and the architect loses, right? And so yeah. what, what could end up happening is a bad example because it doesn't tie to data very well, but uh, when you have those decisions and you have the ability to either present data that supports your direction in advance or the next time around say, hey, you know, this is, we, we thought we would do this, we ended up doing another thing and, and we're seeing that people aren't really spending any time there. So, so it, it helps arm uh, the architect or the design authority uh, to, uh, to win more uh, of those sort of arguments. Absolutely. It's very exciting. I mean, uh, being an architect now or, or a designer or a workplace team, um, there are a lot more tools in your toolbox and it's just a matter of how you choose to use them. Um, awesome. Well, we are almost at time. I want to thank everybody who stuck around for, um, for this chat on intelligent buildings and the philosophical discussion at the end that this uh, turned into. Hope you enjoyed. And if you have any questions, like I mentioned, um, please feel free to connect with Jamie and myself on LinkedIn, reach out and, uh, and message us. All right, with that, we're out. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>